Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. On October 31st, 2000, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1325, which reaffirmed, quote, the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts and in peace building, close quote. Resolution 1325 helped create the Women in Peace and Security Program, or WPS. WPS has grown over the succeeding decades to link different governmental and non-governmental agencies in promoting better understanding of both the impact of international conflict on women and the role of women in security policymaking. As we celebrate the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325, we at A Better Peace felt our listeners should learn more about WPS, its connection to the American defense establishment, and its possible work in the future. Our guest today, retired Major General Kristen Lund of the Norwegian Army, had a distinguished military career and has been active in WPS for quite some time. With wide-ranging command and staff experience at both national and international levels, including as the deputy commander of the Norwegian Army Forces Command, Major General Lund was the Norwegian Army's first female officer to be promoted to the rank of Major General and was subsequently appointed as Chief of Staff of the Norwegian Home Guard. From August 2014 to July 2016, Major General Lund also served as force commander of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Cyprus, becoming the first woman to serve as force commander in a United Nations peacekeeping operation. She's had previous assignments with the United Nations, including the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon and elsewhere. She has extensive experience in multinational operations, including deployment to Saudi Arabia during Operation Desert Storm and at the headquarters of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. Major General Lund has been a member of the Nordic Women Mediation Network since 2015 and currently serves as an advisor at the Norwegian Defense University College in Oslo. Major General Lund has graduated from the Norwegian Defense Command and Staff College and the Norwegian Defense University College, but most importantly for those of us here at A Better Peace, she also graduated from the United States Army War College in the class of 2007, and in 2015, she became the first woman elected to the War College International Fellows Hall of Fame. For all of these reasons, we are delighted to have her with us today. Welcome to A Better Peace, Major General Lund. Thank you. It's so nice to be back, and it's also a pleasure to share my experience. So welcome back to Carlisle. I, I want to ask, how did your experience at the War College, and especially here in Carlisle, how did it shape your career? Oh, it shaped my career. I can uh, underline that. And uh, I must say that uh, as we were told in a way that this will be the best year of your life, you realize that when you got home, uh, what you missed when you had a fantastic year. But I must say that for us coming from Norway, this is kind of when you get through that keyhole to be a student here at the Army War College, they believe at, uh, at home that you will be eligible to become a general. So... Um, I was uh, uh, so pleased uh, to be here. I'm so glad. And um, you, had you been stationed for any length of time in the United States before you uh, came to the War College? No, but uh, my first trip ever to the U.S. was the exchange with the Minnesota National Guard and the Norwegian Home Guard. And for the first time in 1979, uh, they opened up to bring women. So I was the only one from Oslo on that uh, that flight. And we came to Minnesota. And I must say, at that time, I was just kind of volunteer um, uh, in, in, in the Home Guard youth. Mm-hmm. And coming to the U.S. and see the, the National Guard in Minnesota, you know, with their own airstrip, they had, you know, uh, tanks, they had, you know, so many things. I said, well, I think I will 
put in an application to the uh, to the officer candidate school when I come home. Uh, and I did that, and I also made an application to the the um, the University of Agriculture. Uh, I didn't get in there, but I got into the officer candidate school. Huh. So that's how my career started. <laughs> so in one way, my first meeting with the U.S. gave me that love for this country and, and what we have had between our two countries. Well, I, I have to ask based on that. So when you initially joined the uh, Norwegian military, so um, did you know you, you didn't know you wanted to make it a career? or you, well, uh, you know, it, it came mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, uh, my first deployment was in 1986 to South Lebanon. So after there, and then I realized, you know, I like to be in multinational formation. So that kind of uh, little by little, you know, and, and uh, I started to say, well, you know, I should try to make colonel at mm -hmm. least. I didn't go to the most prestigious war, uh, um, um, no, the military academy. But, you know, I said, uh, since I didn't get in there because they said my English was too bad, that kind of kicked my energy. I said, well, I will show them that it's possible if not going to the best schools, uh, but by hard work, you should be able to succeed. So I, I my first goal was colonel, full mm -hmm. colonel. Mm -hmm. And when I then got that, you know, I said, oh, I have to put in a new, uh, that, that was a very strange feeling. Ah. I made this. <laughs> <laughs> So, so then in a way, you know, having to struggle in a way in a male dominant organization um, and you had to work twice as hard, but also, you know, when uh, some uh, of my male um, colleagues didn't want to deploy to the north of Norway, I said, well, I can go and actually it was not my tour. But then, you know, I got that type of uh, experience. And then when I applied then to other positions, they could not, uh, you know, uh, pu push me on to the side because <laughs> I had the exact experience to get those positions. One always has to ask. So when, as you as you hit these career targets, and especially when you're promoted to general officer, did you ever meet any of the senior uh, senior officers, uh, the senior raiders uh, uh, that had that had raised questions about whether or not you would be able to do this? Oh yeah, and you knew, <laughs> and you knew those there were you know they believed in themselves because mm -hmm. they will also believe in a woman mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. general officer. So oh yeah, um, and and uh, of course some of them you know. Uh, didn't like and 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 they kind of didn't dare to say it publicly, mm -hmm. but they within their uh, so and then you always have good uh, peers that can say, well, you know, this guy, he said, you know, that uh, he cannot understand why you got this position, mm -hmm. but um, you know, f for me, sometimes that trigger in a way that uh, that pushed me mm -hmm. um, uh, to do a better job. Sure. Do you feel like uh, your career, because I, I, I think about Norway as a, uh, a model or an example to a lot of its allies about how to integrate women into the armed forces. Do you feel like your career um, is a, uh, is, is, we always say in the U.S. when some things happen, people say only in America. But do you feel as though for you that it was this was an only in Norway situation or? No, I feel that uh, in one way that um, many countries have come forward. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. that uh, UN Security Resolution 1325 has been helpful mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, it is uh, more than 180 countries that have signed up. But uh, there, it takes time. You know, it took 11 years here in the U.S. before you have your first action plan. So in one way, uh, I, I think that uh, many countries have uh, come far. But I think in Norway, what is special there is the whole society. It's mm -hmm. not only the military. And it was actually the laws and acts coming up in the civilian uh, life, you know, or general that made uh, the, you, uh, the, the military to speed up mm -hmm. because they were lacking... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, implementation, and and they still do. We still have. Uh, we still need to celebrate eighth of March mm -hmm. <laughs> in Norway, also. Right. Well, and and, and because because Nor Norway already had a tradition of women in positions of political power yes. even before the uh, the uh, the first general officers. Yeah, and that, and, and that has so much to say. So mm -hmm. and for and I think what is uh, for our military since we have conscription still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the military, you know, that tool that is the last tool in a way to be used in a conflict. 
should reflect the society you, because we have values and, and, and that is sometimes different between men and women. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's so important to reflect uh, our society. Right. Well, and this gets into the question of WPS. Um, and I am, uh, uh, do you have a, a formal role with WPS or or, uh, or are you, by virtue, simply by virtue of the fact that you are a, a woman who's ri risen to general officer, you uh, you are a, 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 a person who can speak to this issue? Well, I'm, I'm sitting in, um, I'm in a network, mm -hmm. uh, a Nordic Women Mediators Network that consists of the Nordic uh, countries. And I'm in the steering group there, and 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 the main um, uh, purpose, you know, is uh, because this was initiated by our minister of of, um, of foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the the why we have this network is that we will tell our politicians that we have, you know, women that can go into peace negotiations, the preparations for negotiations, be in the negotiations in any areas uh, when a country is asking Norway or the Nordic countries to contribute. Um, and as you probably know, Norway is in several. And, uh, and the best example where VPS was implemented was in the Colombian peace process. Uh -huh. So... So I think that's uh, so I'm in that and I'm also in, uh, for example, the Institute for Islamic Strategic Affairs. That's the oldest uh, there. I sit in the board of um, um, board of advisors mm -hmm. and I'm the only woman. Uh, and, um, and that is the oldest think tank, uh, Islamic think tank that is placed in London. And just also whenever we. We are discussing things there. You know, I can bring in uh, the WPS or uh, what we very often say GPS, the Gender mm -hmm. uh, Peace and Security mm -hmm. uh, Agenda. So, uh, so I think that's um, uh, and of course I'm I'm asked and I'm also teaching at the UN uh, courses. Um, that's ceasefires, for example. But then I always bring in that agenda because right. I think it's so vital. Right. And and uh, because conflict involves the whole society, that's why uh, we need to get it in. Right. Well, and <clears throat> this is a, a a complicated question, right? Because of course you know, you are Kristen Lund, a human being with career with with a career with uh, with with interests with with abilities. Um, do you ever get? Uh, is is it ever wearisome? To always be the first woman to do this, the first woman to do that, right? Uh, it, it, it's it's a series of wonderful accomplishments, mm -hmm. and you should be praised for them. But at the same time, right? I know that you you want to be praised for your accomplishments because of who because just because of who you are. Mm -hmm. But how do you feel we as a society can get to the point where having women in positions of leadership and authority can become so commonplace that we don't have to keep thinking about the first woman to do this and the first woman to do that? Yeah, and it will take time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but I must say that it has, you know, as you mentioned before, being you know the first in many things, uh, positions. And so it it uh, it's not easy because it's a lot of pressure. Sure. And another thing that I realized when I was at Cyprus, you mm -hmm. know, being a woman and and the commander of that that uh, that operation, um, you. There are so many doors that opens up because mm -hmm. you are women, ah. a woman, mm -hmm. and and um, and that's why. Uh, and I I choose to go in those doors, because uh, that way, you know, I got inputs from so many levels of the society that for me, as a military leader, strategically, I got a much wider perspective uh, by doing um, by by you know going through these doors and said yes to all public speaking, all these other female networks and also male networks, you know, mm -hmm. business uh, networks. And, and of course, for them, since you were the first female in, right. in that uh, UN history, I got a lot of uh, invitations, but mm -hmm. I tried because I felt that the military task uh, was not the most difficult because mm -hmm. if you are a clear leader and you give you know right and and left to your commanders, uh, they should know uh, what to do. Right. So that's why I, I and and I know all what I got from the society mm -hmm. was helping me to take the right decisions militarily. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were if, if since 
so Norway has this tradition of international organizations. Um, is that something that officers in the Norwegian military are, uh, do you choose to participate or is this, is it as a matter of course that what, if you rise to a certain rank or certain position that you're going to be expected to participate in these international organizations, the UN operations, for example? Well, UN has uh, always a huge demand mm. of, of, uh, of countries to uh, participate and, and Norway's uh, Norway have always been participating, but lately, because of uh, all high tech and, and and Norway has changed from being more specialized and niche uh, capabilities mm -hmm. to be more with infantry combat uh, units, and from UN to NATO operations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't have very many, but uh, UN, they send out um, requests to a lot of nations. Uh, and, you know, on that level to be uh, leading an operation or head of mission, uh, you will be seconded. So you mm -hmm. actually you will leave uh, without pay uh, from your own uh, military and go into the UN system. Oh. And so the U, so so you end up so for that brief period, right? You are you are an employee of the United Nations. You're no longer. Uh, yes, you know. and that that's also a little strange because mm -hmm. actually, even though you wear a uniform, mm -hmm. you are on a civilian contract. Oh, so, uh, and yeah, that's interesting in a way. And um, but I must say, uh, for me, uh, uh, they asked me um, because it was important, and and. Uh, the, uh, the deputy um, secretary of the defense, he took me to a tour to the UN in 2011. Mm -hmm. And we they kind of showed me around and said, you know, because uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the general secretary, mm -hmm. um, Ban Ki-moon at that time, said that there are no countries that have female generals. Wow. So Norway said, well, we have one. And so they took me on this trip there and kind of showed me around, went to the U.S. Uh, delegation because it's an important player. And uh, and then Norway got this this uh, uh, request in a way in 2013. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, an agreement between the, uh, the DOD and the State Department. And in Norway, it's the State Department or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that are the leading mm. um, uh, ministry when it comes to you and so forth. So then uh, I was the candidate and, um, and then I went through all the interviews and, and then I was going. Right. And um, what's your what's your sense of you know, in the United States, people have a lot of uh, a lot of, let's say, uh, prejudgments about the United Nations, about how it works, um, about its effectiveness. Um, what, what, what are your impressions of the UN organizations? I always be pro mm -hmm. of, of the United Nations because I think so far this is the only tool mm -hmm. uh, so far that we have seen. Um, and, um, and I think it is important to bring other uh, nations together mm -hmm. to make and we saw that you know the nato operation in afghanistan you couldn't have done it by themselves us could not have done it by themselves you need uh, all these players and countries there and that's also leads in a way back to uh, the army war college because you see then and i have used all my my uh, uh, counterparts you know mm -hmm. the ifs uh, and that always gives you a good foundation wherever you are deployed. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I believe in the UN. Of course, there is a lot of bureaucracy, mm -hmm. but it's a huge organization. Um, and um, but I, I, you know, you could get some gray hairs uh, <laughs> now and then, but I think you can get that in all big organizations. Sure. So uh, and uh, but so far, uh, as long as we don't have another tool. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that's a, a, a vital tool. Right. So we have and, to make we have to make the one that we have work. And that's exactly because mm -hmm. UN is what you and I make it to be. Mm -hmm. It's the nations. Mm -hmm. And if the nations are not willing, because some uh, strong other uh, within a nation can gain on that conflict. And that's, that's what you also feel when you get out there, that right. there are so many that are pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. And 
so two questions come to mind about this, and uh, I'm going to ask them both. But, uh, but the first one is, is as a, a former international fellow at the War College, have you ever been at an overseas deployment or at a, or at a uh, even at a reception and uh, met someone else who was an international fellow at the War College? Yes. Yes. Just even, sort of randomly to talk about your experiences. You know, uh, uh, just when I arrived to Cyprus, mm -hmm. the the sector commander of the Argentinian uh, sector. Mm -hmm was a uh, graduate uh, after me mm -hmm. after me though mm -hmm. and the one up in the north the security forces uh, the um, um, cyprus uh, turkish security forces mm -hmm. was led by a graduate from the army work calls so so for you know for me when we had our talks that sometimes were difficult mm -hmm. we knew we had a common foundation that makes made those um, uh, talks much easier. And I was, you know, when he uh, ended his tour, because all the, uh, the general officers uh, in the north of Cyprus comes from the mainland, mm -hmm. Turkey. Right. And, um, and when he uh, became the chief of staff of the Izmir NATO uh, headquarters there, he invited me and, and some of my, my uh, other fellows saw that he had a picture of me in his office. So uh, <laughs> so it was great. And, and he said, you know, when she comes here, I need to, to see her again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, that helped. And the other, the three-star uh, general that was leading the, the so-called peace force in the north, uh, he had worked in NATO in Brussels mm -hmm. with Norwegians, so, mm -hmm. and we had common friends. See, and uh, so, so in a one way, you see how much you know being in multinational formations counts. Right. Well, and I'm fascinated by this because this is a, a, an indication that being a student at the War College, it's not just sort of a hub and spoke relationship no. of you know you and the Americans, the Americans and somebody else, but it's these international connections that that can be forged by this experience i know the my colleagues at the if office will be delighted about this part of the interview so thank you for getting that in there right this is this is exactly what we want to talk about but then r the other question that i wanted to ask was when we talk about the un and you talk about wps as a as a program as an idea um how well integrated are the um, the ideas and the principles of women in peace and security in the organizations that you have uh, worked with is it is it a matter of you bringing these questions in, or is there a is there a, a place where there will be a sort of a consistent uh, sort of checking in whether whether the organization is is doing all that it can for women in peace and security? I can just take an example from mm -hmm. Cyprus. Mm -hmm. um, the head of mission was an American, mm -hmm. Lisa Bettenheim. Um, I was then, uh, you know, the force commander and the rest of the leader group, uh, we had 75% of, uh, uh, of the leader group was women. It was the first <laughs> time in my uh, world, uh, in the military world, that I had a, a female uh, chief. Wow. Uh, and it was the first time I never ever had uh, or needed to have any, uh, use any uh, of my time to convince uh, my my chief that uh, VPS was important. Mm -hmm. So and and you know when we met with uh, politicians, um, visits from the troop contributing uh, countries, uh, we put gender on top of the agenda, mm -hmm. and that increased the number of female uh, military um, uh, personnel from four to eight percent. For the UN police, uh, from ten to twenty-five percent, wow. just by uh, by putting it from the bottom of the agenda, that it's very often is mm -hmm. to the top. Mm -hmm. So, so but it has to be anchored at the top node in the organization, right? Because yes, you have a lot that are working from the bottom and up, but uh, and I think that if you want to do uh, make a change. It has to be anchored on the top. It has to be anchored at the top. Because then you send that message mm -hmm. down and it will drizzle down right. uh, in the organization. Interesting. See, that's, I, I uh, and, and of course, this is where, you know, if you get to the point where there are women in positions of authority who will at least be willing to put this on the agenda, that there can be a kind of natural development in the sense that it, it's, it becomes, you know, people look around the room and we want to reach the time where it's unusual to see no women in the room, right? Instead of it being unusual to see a woman in the room, it should be unusual to see no women in the room, right? And 
It's, it's like, you know, for 20 years of my career, mm -hmm. you know, the, the what you have been meeting every morning, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Mm, right. Even though you have been there for 20 years, <laughs> but you have not been seen. Right. So, um, so it has taken some time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, uh, uh, both, uh, well, Guterres, the general uh, secretary of the UN, he set in a very hard parity strategy mm -hmm. among the civilians mm -hmm. and he was able to implement that within two years mm -hmm. for all the kind of sub uh, leader groups and levels and also the civilian that are uh, head of missions mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. so so it's possible mm -hmm. if you put your will to it and it's important right because it's because it, it we are long past the assumption people can make that, well, I wanted to include women, but there just aren't any to include, yeah. right? Those, those that, days should be gone. And, and yes, that's, uh, uh, that's not an excuse. And, 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 and there are women out there. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Interesting. Well, and thinking about, about back about, about your career, about being a strategic leader, um, are there particular strategic leaders, military or civilian, past or present, that you consider role models or inspirations for your work? Yes, you know, as I mentioned, Elisa Buttenheim mm -hmm. was that for mm -hmm. me because that was the first time ever I had. And and the way that, you know, she was maneuvering in difficult times uh, was good. And then there are also men mm -hmm. uh, that I've seen uh, that I learned a lot from mm -hmm. and, um, and try to implement in my leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but, you know, they are... Most of them are Norwegian, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but I, I must say uh, we went uh, up to, when I was here, uh, to uh, meet um, the Marine, um, his name, uh, he is retired now, and he was uh, on the staff uh, in, uh, in um, uh, President Trump's... Um, oh, you think of General Mattis. Mattis, yeah. And I must say, what a man, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to have 10 minutes with him well, mm -hmm. on our trip, mm -hmm. and it ended up, I think, with two hours. Yeah. And, and his way of approaching different strategic uh, issues was, mm -hmm. you know, so I said, wow. And, um, and then, of course, lately, I also had some of my, my, um, my seminar mates, mm -hmm. like uh, General Paul uh, Nakasone, uh, he also, uh, I was uh, really, uh, I was looking, uh, you know, when he advanced because we were on the same level for a long time and then right. suddenly, woof. Uh, <laughs> so and, you were in the same seminar here at the yeah, War yeah, College? Yeah. What seminar number were you, by the way? That was uh, seminar four. Seminar four. Yeah. Shout out to seminar four yeah. listeners. So, so that was, uh, we were sitting next to each other mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, Coming from Norway into a seminar, we were uh, uh, one from El Salvador. Mm -hmm. But as I, I said, you know, you know, they they have uh, U.S. dollars as the currency, so they, you know, <laughs> and I came from Europe, so of course uh, we had a lot of discussions, and and I I learned so much from that, you know, uh, to dare to put my head on the block, and and the professors they were very happy because. Uh, uh, that trigger uh, good discussions in For the sure. seminar. And to my, uh, also that was strange to me because before you had so many people in Europe that mm -hmm. knew Europe, but I think in a seminar, it was only one that had been deployed to, uh, to Europe. Right. Um, and not very many that have been deployed uh, overseas. Uh, they have been to Iraq, uh, some in Afghanistan. But I expected because uh, uh, U.S. are all over. Uh, so uh, <laughs> right. I found out that, that I, you know, I have much more deployments than them coming from Little Norway. That was also strange. But as I said, you learn so much from your seminar. Sure. No, that's always a good experience, and it, and it is interesting to look around the room. I encourage current students of the War College, right, when you're looking around the room in seminars, you never know which of those people is going gonna, is gonna to end up with a star or two no. on their shoulder, right, and where they're going to go. That's true. Well, and uh, so one last question uh, for you, and that is, so uh, think back to when you, were, uh, when you were an enlistee or even when you were second lieutenant uh, Lund. Um, is there any advice that uh, that that when you think now as a strategic leader that you would have liked to have given or have uh, have received as second lieutenant Lund from a successful senior leader that that uh, that you'd like to pass along now. 
I think quite early I started to try to look to step up mm -hmm. and find, you know, what do I need of experience? Mm -hmm. So especially to women, I, I advise them when I look back, think with your head in the beginning before your heart. Because if you do that and, and get that foundation that you need so you can apply to different types of positions. I have applied for a position that was not, that I, it was not my first choice, mm -hmm. but I thought this will be important because I, I looked to step up. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is my advice in a way to, uh, to uh, young uh, military students when I uh, speech, mm -hmm. uh, speak. And also, I also want sometimes to, to say that it was my leadership developed during deployments. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I was kind of shaped as the leader I have become today. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and certainly what you have become today is is pretty impressive. And we're delighted that you're visiting us here at Carlisle, that you're here to speak. I know you'll be speaking to the students uh, uh, tomorrow after we re record this. But uh, for today, as our time runs out of the hourglass, Major General Kristen Lund, thank you so much for joining us on A Better Peace. And thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for all of us. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and on all the programs and send us your suggestions for future programs. And if you, uh, we ask that you please subscribe to A Better Peace. And after you have subscribed, please rate and review this podcast because that is how other people can find us too. We're always interested in growing this community for conversations like this one. And although this conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you again. So until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.